Yet another big video game franchise is being turned into a TV show, and it appears that Hollywood is creatively bankrupt. Good morning, good Tuesday morning to you. I'm Shane Satterfield from Sifted, and this is Good Morning Gaming for March 8th, 2022. The show is in our patrons' feeds bright and early every weekday morning, and free on our YouTube channel for everyone else. You can find our flagship show, Game Face, by searching your favorite podcast service, You'll find the podcast versions of the rest of our content in the same feed you found this. So Amazon announced today that it is working on a God of War TV series for Amazon Prime Video. The Expanse creators and executive producers Mark Fergus and Hawk Osby, as well as the Wheel of Time executive producer and showrunner Rafe Judkins, are said to be involved in the project. Sony Productions and Sony Pictures Television are also involved somehow, though that isn't really clear. Just to rewind, Fallout and Mass Effect shows are also on the way from Amazon, so it's looking like the ultimate destination for game-related pop culture going forward. Now, in the past, video game-related movies have been awful, abysmal. Remember Uwe Boll? Haven't seen him for a long time. And I'll be honest... That's because real professionals have actually stepped into the void to improve these gaming-related shows and movies. And I am not complaining. I am a huge fan of God of War. I'm a huge fan of Fallout. I'm a huge fan of Mass Effect. I'm a huge fan of Halo. All these projects, I am absolutely interested in. They're trying to reach my demographic, the middle-aged, hardcore gamer. They're doing a great job. I do wonder just how many of those people there are. One thing that The Witcher proved is that even a video game franchise that I would argue the mass audience, at least in America, is not familiar with The Witcher. It sells well, but people who are not game players had no idea what The Witcher was. In fact, a lot of my friends who don't play games had no idea it was based on a video game at all. They told me they heard it was kind of like Game of Thrones, and so they gave it a try. And to be fair, most of them ended up liking it and followed up and watched season two. So the quality of game-based movies and TV shows has gone up significantly. The Uncharted movie notwithstanding, though that movie did quite well financially, if not with the critics. So I'm not going to complain that there are more gaming-related pop culture, media projects in the works right now. I'm just not, because I love it. I'm very happy about it. But it does kind of shine a light on people who are supposed to be the most creative people on the planet, the people who work in Hollywood, the people who make the magic, that transport us to magical worlds for two to three hours at a time that help us forget all our troubles, everything that's going on in our life that we would just rather forget. Where has that creativity gone? Why have they been forced to rely on IP that honestly a lot of people have never heard of? So it's not like the name is going to automatically draw people to the theaters. The movie has to be good. The trailers have to be good. It has to capture the attention of the average pop culture consumer. I honestly cannot think of a new TV or film IP that was created out of nothing. Every movie is a sequel now. It's either a sequel to something that was successful before, or it's based on a comic book, or it's based on a video game, where all the heavy lifting, all the hard work is already done for them. The world is created. The characters are created. The conflict between the characters is already there. All the hard stuff. Ask George R.R. R. Martin how much he was paid just to do those tasks for Elden Ring. It's not easy, which may be why they're doing it in the first place, but isn't that an admission that you've lost the ability to create things on your own? Why was Game of Thrones such a sensation? One, it was a great TV show. But two, 
it managed to create a new world people had not experienced before. It wasn't based on anything other than a series of books that, in all honesty, only the nerdiest of the nerds ever read. I remember people bringing those books into work, and I would look at the size of them, <laughs> and then I'd think about the amount of free time I had after doing my job, having to play hours and hours of games every week, and I just said, no way. But the TV show managed to construct that world into something spellbinding for the average pop culture consumer. Again, using the ideas of another to create something. Where have all the ideas gone? Again, I can think of a movie franchise, at least a live action movie franchise. There are animated franchises that I can sort of pull out of the haystack. But I cannot think of any sci-fi new movie franchises or TV shows that are based on something original. They're all based on something else. Where has the creativity gone? Or is it just all driven by data? Is it the studios not wanting to take risks? Now, I would get that right now. The movie industry has been raked over the coals during the pandemic. We're lucky that it actually held on. So I don't blame studios right now for being extremely risk averse. They kind of have to be. I get it. But we're talking about something that's been going on now for a good decade. I'm also a big fan of comic books. I read them as a kid. I did lose touch with them. Mostly because, again, I just didn't have the time to keep up. As my life got busier, I had to prioritize. And to me, games were more important than keeping up with comics. But I did read them growing up. I'm familiar with most of the characters. And I really like the movies based on comic books. It's great to see these mythical heroes and villains from my childhood come to life with big budgets, mind you, that make it really convincing. And I'll be honest, I am still shocked that the average American moviegoer got so wrapped up into this stuff because I remember being made fun of for liking those characters back when I was young. I remember being an outcast for liking that stuff. So while Hollywood is bereft of new ideas, it has managed to do an amazing job of marketing. Making these properties that people used to make fun of must see TV or must go to the theater viewing. And that's probably where the issue is coming from. All decisions in entertainment anymore are made with spreadsheets. Looking at the demographic, looking at how much money that demographic is willing to spend, how much disposable income they have, how likely they are to resonate with certain ideas. That's what decides what gets a green light now. And so while it's worked out very well for me and for you, it's a little bit sad to see what I thought at least growing up and even into adulthood were the most creative people in the world completely falling on their faces at their jobs. And now for a couple more stories from the top of your sifts. A new developer livestream for the Dead Space remake is coming on Friday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. We haven't heard anything from this game since last September when Motive Studios held its first live stream showing off significant amounts of in-engine footage. And I mean a lot. And not just in-engine footage, they showed footage from development tools, which is very out of the norm. The good news is we're five or six months past that now, so the game should be a lot further along. So we fully expect there to be a lot more than that on Friday, and it should be far more polished and complete, so be sure to tune in. We'll have it curated to your SIFs so you won't miss it. The Gizmodo Media Group Union has struck a deal for a new contract with Kotaku owners Go Media. The popular gaming blog's writers were previously on strike awaiting a new deal, and it appears that it's a favorable one. The team is getting higher minimum salaries with guaranteed raises, a guarantee against forced relocation, new benefits, and more. 62000 is now the lowest beginning salary at Kotaku, which is up from 55000 Staff will get guaranteed 3% annual raises, which isn't much unless you're making decent money already, and then that can add up pretty quick. They'll also get 15 weeks of parental leave and 12 weeks minimum severance. So if you're laid off, they're going to have to pay you for the next three months. The deal is just awaiting a ratification vote from its members. Congratulations to the staff at Kotaku. 
Square Enix action RPG Forspoken has been delayed to October 12th, 2022 from its original May 24th release date. It's a delay of about five months. And I'll be honest, this is a game that I'm pretty excited about. It's very bizarre. Basically, this young woman from Brooklyn gets transported to this fantasy world where she has a bracelet that talks to her. It's so insane. I can't wait to see how they pull it off. It's also under development by the same team that made Final Fantasy XV, which, if I'm being honest, does make me a little bit nervous. The developer, Luminous Productions, released a statement explaining the delay, and it reads, quote, We have made the decision to move the release date of Forspoken to October 11th, 2022. Our vision for this exciting new IP is to deliver a game world and hero that gamers across the globe will want to experience for years to come. So getting it right is extremely important to us. To that end, during the next few months, we will focus all our efforts on polishing the game and can't wait for you to experience Frey's journey this fall. End quote. Delays like this sometimes lead to more delays, so we're definitely not counting on the game releasing in 2022 at this point, but five months of polish is a lot, so we're hoping it amounts to something special. Gran Turismo 7's opening lap at retail has been a quick one. The game has debuted in pole position in the UK box chart starting grid. Elden Ring is drafting right behind GT7 with the 69% sales drop from last week. Switch console exclusive Triangle Strategy was at the back of the pack at number 7. Okay, we'll stop with the bad racing puns now. After I ragged on gaming companies for not doing more to help Ukraine in yesterday's episode of Good Morning Gaming, I feel like I need to follow up when one does things right. Take-Two has halted sales, marketing, and more in Russia and Belarus. It's also preventing its games from even being installed in the two countries. This is exactly what I said all gaming companies need to do. Cut them off from the actual games. Let's keep piling on the pressure in hopes that we can win by a thousand paper cuts. Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll tackle today's boss fight. Welcome to today's boss fight where I tackle random topics that may or may not be related to video games. We've all heard the saying, when a tree falls in the woods and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, we tested that theory yesterday with our exclusive information on Grand Theft Auto 6. It's no secret that Sifted is nowhere near as big as websites like IGN or GameSpot or Polygon or Kotaku. We're a little guy. We're scrappy. We've been around for over half a decade now. It's been a lot of hard work, but we've survived thanks to people like you. But I'll be honest. When you have big information in 2022, you just assume that by hook or by crook, that information is going to be disseminated out into the internet and into the ether. You don't even think that you have to do much. You feel like you just got to put the little boat in the pond, and then the wind will just take it off. That is not what happened for us. So this morning at 10 a.m. on Monday, which is the ideal time to debut any type of news on social media, we posted links to a story where Michael Pachter had some of the first details on Grand Theft Auto 6. Again, we're a smaller outlet, so we don't have a ton of followers on social media. My personal account has a pretty big audience. And so we tweeted from Sifted's official account, and then I retweeted it to my bigger audience. And crickets. The article was not picked up by a single major gaming website. There were a couple smaller guys who picked it up and ran it, but none of the big guys did. And I don't know if it's that they didn't see it. I don't know... If it's they saw it and didn't want to run it, I don't know if they saw it and didn't believe it. I have no idea why none of these sites picked up the story. It's especially puzzling in light of an experiment that I talked about on Good Morning Gaming recently where a YouTuber started a fake Twitter account 
and essentially just tweeted hundreds and hundreds of tweets guessing at stuff that may happen in the future and then left them private. And then as the things actually happened, he would turn the tweets public and they would be time stamped and date stamped, which would lead people to believe that he had guessed these things weeks or months prior. He suckered so many people. There was a major gaming publication that ran a story based upon his fake Twitter account. And yet, Michael Pachter, who's been working in the games industry for decades and has a lot to lose by reporting false information, obtained some information about Grand Theft Auto 6, we ran it, and no one seemed to care. It's hard to accept that if this story had just come from some random account that was set up just like that experiment I talked about, I believe it would have gotten some pickup. Perhaps publications are leery of running information now after what happened due to that little experiment where a couple fairly big publications got burned. I don't know. But it's very strange. We have information on what will probably be the biggest video game ever released will probably be the only game to ever outsell Grand Theft Auto V, and it was crickets. What gives? And here's a little background, in case you're sitting there saying, people didn't trust it, they didn't want to run it. Here's a little background on how the whole thing played out. So we were recording Pactor Factor, it was about a month ago now, maybe a little less, and... He shared the information during the recording about Grand Theft Auto 6. And if you want that information, you can head to Sifted and you can find it. If you're watching this show on YouTube, it's on our YouTube channel. You can watch it there. So I'm not going to go through all the details of the game. That's not what I really want to discuss here. So anyway, he shares the information that he has about Grand Theft Auto 6 with me. And he told me where he got the information. And it's about as reliable of a source as you can get. So... I went home. I knew what I was sitting on. At least I thought it was a big deal. I know if a story like that was published by another outlet, we would curate it with a high rating on Sifted, particularly if it came from someone like Michael Pachter, who has a reputation to uphold, and if he were to spread false information, it could be disastrous. And he cares a whole lot about his reputation in the industry. He would not jeopardize that. How often does he talk about the people that come to his E3 party? It's very important to him. So anyway, I go home. I know what I've got. And I think it's a big deal. It would be a big deal to me if another outlet ran it. But I didn't want to publish it right away. I have had this information for about a month now and didn't publish it. And the reason... I didn't want to publish it is because I wanted to make sure that Pactor was 100% sure. Sometimes when we record stuff, he'll say things. And when I go to edit the episode together a week or two later, I'll contact him and be like, hey, you sure you want this to run? And sometimes he'll say, oh, absolutely. And sometimes he'll say, you know what? On second thought, you know, I don't think it adds anything to my answer. You might as well just get rid of it. So we've always had this dialogue, this back and forth with stuff that he does for Sifted. And he trusts me. So I come home. I have this information about the biggest video game ever. And I sit on it and I wait. And a couple days afterwards, I followed up with him. I was like, hey, just want to check in. We're kind of planning on rolling this out with a pretty big plan. You know, we want to get it out there. And I want to know if you're okay with that. And he was like, absolutely, no problems. I was like, okay. So I cut a few episodes of Pactor Factor from that batch of episodes, and I followed up with him again. I was like, hey, we're getting to the point where we're about to run this. Are you 100% sure about this? Are you sure your source is good? Again, no questions. Nope, run it, solid. Cut a couple more episodes of Pactor Factor. I finally get to the point in the batch of episodes where he shared the information about Grand Theft Auto 6. And I started working on it this weekend, and I got to the point where I was cutting it together, and I contacted him again. And I was like, okay, final chance. We're going to run this on Monday morning. 
and I want to make sure you're still good to go. Nope, run it. It's all good. So I write up the article. I send over the copy for the article to him. He checks it out. He's like, looks great. Run it. And that's what we did. I'm not even going to pretend to try to guess why this happened. And honestly, I wasn't expecting it to set the internet on fire or anything like that, but I seriously thought it would get some traction and it would do okay. Right now, the YouTube video with this information is doing no better than an average episode of Pactor Factor on YouTube. Not to mention that instead of holding the episode for a week like we usually do, we published it day and date for free on our YouTube channel, and it made no difference whatsoever. So I'm completely flummoxed on why this happened. There are ideas, obviously, that I have. I have theories of why it's happened. It could be that some publications just didn't want to run it because they're upset that he got the information and they didn't. Truthfully, a lot of the bigger publications generally don't publish stories like this at all. It's usually like the second and third tier of gaming websites that will do it. So I wasn't expecting IGN to point to it. Although, maybe... It is Michael Pactor, and I wasn't expecting GameSpot to point to it, and I wasn't expecting Polygon to point to it. I'm assuming that they're all beating the streets trying to get information on the game, too. And maybe, you know, they saw it and they're like, crap, you know? I don't know. I don't know why it happened. But I do know part of it is that we are starting from a place of weakness. If IGN or GameSpot or Polygon published a story like this, people would go running to those publications. And I understand why. It's because those big publications have a lot to lose if they misreport something. It's the same thing Michael Pactor is dealing with. Michael Pactor goes beyond sifted. I know you guys just think of him as this affable, funny guy who answers your questions on the internet. That's not the real Michael Pactor. I mean, he is affable and funny, and he's a great guy. But in his private life, he's... He's a big player. Go back and watch the 100th episode of Pactor Factor and look at the people who came on the show to wish him a congratulations. It's crazy. The people that came out to do that. And it was a pain in the butt for them. They had recorded on their cell phone. A lot of these guys are older. They had to record stuff on their cell phone and figure out how to like upload it to an FTP. It was, they had to jump through hoops. Michael Pactor is not some dude sitting on Twitter, making fake Twitter accounts, and throwing crap around hoping he gets attention. He doesn't care. What he cares about are his relationships with people in the industry. And anyone who thinks that he would throw that away over something that does him no good, this information only does sifted good. It doesn't help him in any way. If anything, the next time he talks to the CEO of Take-Two, which he does all the time... It's going to be awkward for him. There was no upside for him sharing this information. None. So, if by chance editors are out there listening to this, which probably not, but if they are, the critical thinking skills on this weren't especially good. I did everything I could to verify the information and to make sure that he was making a sound decision with the information that would not come back to haunt him or haunt Sifted. I care about Pactor. If I thought for a second that this story would somehow harm his reputation, I would have never ran it. It's not worth it. And obviously now it definitely wouldn't have been worth it. So it's tough on the internet. I'm not telling you who to trust or not trust, but I think a lot of times when you're trying to figure out whether you should believe something or not, first of all, look at the source. Is it a public person or is it a name on Twitter with an anime avatar? Or is it a businessman who interacts with the entire industry? There's a big difference there. So think about it. Think about what that person or that entity has to lose the next time you decide whether you should believe something or not. Thanks for listening to Good Morning Gaming. I appreciate every single one of you who listens to GMG. I'm Shane Satterfield. Do what the cool kids do and follow me on Twitter at Dinfire. And then follow Sifted at Sifted Games. 
When you're done with that, head to patreon.com slash sifted and drop us a pledge. We'll be back with another episode tomorrow, but until then, make sure you seize today, because there will never be another.